Welcome back everybody and today what we're going to be going over in lecture is going to be the topic of New France. Now when we were last in lecture we talked about the Spanish as they began to explore the North, Amer North American as well as the South American continents. But today we're going to be focusing on their rivals that were beginning to arrive shortly after they had begun to not only uh, explore but also colonize the American continents. Now by the early 1500s, as the Spanish were beginning to establish the first colonies within New Spain, it became evident that world trade was beginning to shift from the main continents of Europe, Africa, and Asia to that of the Atlantic Ocean, with the New World now being opened up to world trade. And quickly as we had seen last time, and as we had seen with the Spanish, they become extremely rich, especially from finding gold and silver that we see present over in the Americas. And it wasn't long before we start to see other European powers look to tap into this new economic uh, uh, trading region that we see out in the Atlantic to hopefully establish their own colonies, create their own profits, and create their own empire that might rival that of the Spanish. However, during much of the 16th century, during the 1500s, we'll see that the Spanish will continue to dominate the Atlantic Ocean, but we'll see several other European powers will try to rival them out in the Atlantic. And the first of the European powers that will come to try to rival the Spanish in the Americas would be that of France. Now France itself, it was emerging as a leading power within Europe at this time. And uh, by the early 1500s, it was becoming interested in getting involved in this new trade that we see develop over in the Americas. But by the early 1500s, it's still important for us to recognize Spain was extremely strong in those regions. They were actually in the business of trying to snuff out any per, uh, other European power from s establishing a colony over in the New World. And several times during the 16th century, you'll see that many colonies will fail as a result of the uh, Spanish uh, suppressing them. But anyways, the French are going to be the first other European power to try to rival that of the Spanish. Now with the Spanish uh, trying to snuff out many of these colonies, the French are going to have to find a region on the North American continent to where they could hopefully eventually colonize to where it would be out of the way of the Spanish, to where the Spanish would not think twice about um, going to, uh, uh, going to um, uh, threaten those colonies. And this is where eventually we'll see the French are going to grow interested in what is now modern day Canada. But before we start talking about French exploration as well as colonization within modern day Canada, we need to ask ourselves that same question. Why did the French explore? Well, as we had already talked about just a moment ago, the French are going to explore the North American continent for trade. And specifically, they're going to explore the North American continent for a very lucrative trade that was beginning to develop by the middle of the 16th century, that of the fur trade. Now, as we'll see here in a minute, during the 16th century, the French aren't going to establish a permanent colony in the New World, but they will establish several outposts. They will establish fisheries off of the North American coastline, and from these fisheries, they will begin to come into their first contacts with the Algonquin as well as the Iroquois-speaking uh, tribes that we see in the American Northeast. And once they begin to make contact with these natives, they will find that there is a very lucrative commodity that's extremely rare over in Europe that will bring about high profits within that region, and it will be that of fur, and particularly that of uh, beaver fur. But anyways, we're going to start off with the fur trade. That will be one of their main motivations to why they will further explore the North American continent and eventually why it's going to lead them down the road to colonization. Another reason to why the French are going to explore the North American continent is going to be because they are still trying to find a pathway out into the Pacific. Remember, the main reason that we see the uh, Spanish initially uh, go west was to try to find a route over to Asia. Now, even by the 16th century, even by the beginning of the 17th century a little bit, you'll see that most European powers believed that there was some route over into the Pacific. For the French in particular, they believed there was a northwest passage to where if you just went a little bit north of the landmass of the modern uh, North American uh, continent, you would find a great body of water that would lead you straight to the Pacific. However, as we'll see, they will never find this northwest passage as it simply just doesn't exist. But nonetheless, they will continue to try throughout much of the 16th century to find this passage to eventually find a way over to the Pacific and eventually to, um, to Asia. Now, by the uh, 16th century, they will begin to establish several outposts, as I mentioned a moment ago. 
But they do begin to realize, especially as they become more heavily involved in this fur trade, they have other rivals in the region that were looking to tap into this fur trade to bring it back to Europe to establish their own profits. And the French, because of this competition, it's going to lead them down the road to establish their own colony. Now, by the late 16th century, they will have several efforts to establish a colony within the um, North American continent. Officially, New France would be created in 1534, but we won't see the first permanent colony established until we get to 1608, when we see the establishment of uh, Quebec. And that leads us to our next topic, that of French colonization. Now, the uh, first uh, colony that will be established by the French is going to be that of Quebec. Now, Quebec itself is going to be established along the St. Lawrence River. Now, the St. Lawrence River, if you look at it in a map, it was an extremely wide river, especially at its mouth. And many Frenchmen at first are going to believe that the St. Lawrence River was that northwest passage that would lead them out to the Pacific coast. And by 1608, the latest French explorer to uh, the uh, St. Lawrence River would be that of a man by the name of Samuel J. Champlain. Now, de Champlain, he has two goals. One, in 1608, he wants to see if he can maybe find that Northwest Passage, which they believe was the uh, uh, St. Lawrence River. And two, he was intent on establishing a permanent trading outpost in the North American continent for the French, so that way they can further tap into this uh, fur trade. Now, in 1608, he will float well down the St. Lawrence River. It will bleed into uh, the Great Lakes, but he'll quickly realize that this was no um, Northwest Passage that he was hoping for. But nonetheless, he will turn back and eventually he would find his way to a narrow portion of the St. Lawrence River to where he would establish Quebec, which is just north of where we see upstate New York as well as uh, Maine today. Now, Quebec itself, it will not become a major metropolis. As mentioned before, it's really just going to be a trading city. It will be really a fortification upon a set of heights that are on the banks of the St. Lawrence River. Now, from establishing this city, Quickly, the, the roughly 300 or so French inhabitants of the Quebec City, they're going to be predominantly male, and they're going to engulf themselves into the local fur trade. However, by getting involved in the fur trade surrounding Quebec, this is going to lead to lingering consequences that we'll see arise later on, and uh, not just uh, the history of uh, what we'll see here in Canada, but also within American history when we get to the French and Indian War, as well as the American Revolution. Now, when the French begin to colonize Quebec, their motives are going to be very different from what we'd seen with the Spanish. Now, the Spanish, when they came to colonize New Spain, they wanted to conquer and forcibly assimilate the native populations under the crown of the, um, of the Spanish king. That will be the polar opposite of what the French will do. While they will look to Christianize and uh, convert many of the native tr tribes that we see in uh, Canada over to Catholicism, they're going to follow a policy of cooperation with the natives. They realize that the natives knew where all these furs were. And two, they realized from the inception of their colony, the natives heavily outnumbered them. While the Europeans, or I should say the French, while they may have had the guns being heavily outnumbered, they could be virtually wiped out by the native population. So they had to create good relations with the local tribes, especially surrounding Quebec City. Now, the major tribes that they're going to encounter around Quebec are going to be those Algonquin-speaking tribes. Now, the Algonquin-speaking tribes, one thing we need to understand about them, and hopefully I made this clear, whether I made it clear in the lecture or whether you've seen it within the um, uh, readings for uh, uh, the topic over pre-Columbian America, they are not the only tribal group that we see in the North American continent. The North American continent is extremely diverse in the tribal groups that we see amongst the natives. And many of these tribal groups, with their diverse religious beliefs and practices, they're going to be often at war with one another. And in this case, the Algonquin-speaking peoples surrounding Quebec, they are going to be at war with the Haudenosaunee peoples who are just to the south in upstate New York, who are better known as the Iroquois nations. Now, the French, when they arrive in Quebec City and they establish it, they're basically going to make a military alliance with the um, Algonquin-speaking peoples. Because they realized if they did not make this alliance, they would, one, not be able to trade with them, but two, they probably could be wiped out themselves. But through this alliance, they basically declared that the Iroquois tribes to the south were their enemies and that they would help the Algonquins in future wars against them. And it wasn't long before we see the French, as well as the Iroquois tribes to the south, open up and open hostilities. Most notably when we see a first battle occur in 1609 on the um, banks of what is now today Lake Champlain, which is named after the French explorer that we just talked about here a moment ago. 
But anyways, in 1609, this is where we will see that warfare will be revolutionized in the Northeast, and it will change, especially once we get to the French and Indian War a little bit later on, and see how that will have major consequences. Now, the Native Americans, one thing we need to understand, they didn't have steel or iron weapons. Nonetheless, they did not even have what's known as the boomstick to the Europeans, or as we better know them, the gun. Now, at the uh, battle that will take place off the uh, banks of Lake Champlain, this will be the first time that we'll see European weapons, European guns, introduced in warfare over the North American continent. And it will come to transform warfare for years to come. Now, initially, what we'll see is the French and their Al Algonquin-speaking um, allies are going to have the advantage. They were the only ones with guns. Imagine if you were one of these Native Americans, whether you're an Algonquin-speaking person or if you're an Iroquois-speaking person. You've never seen this loud weapon that produces a large flash and that ultimately would kill three of their chiefs in the first engagement. This is going to frighten them and this is going to drastically transform how they viewed warfare and how uh, warfare will be conducted in the northeastern portion of the North American continent for years to come. Now, for the time being, the French, as well as their Algonquin-speaking allies, are going to have the advantage. They have the gun, their enemies, the Iroquois, do not. And for the course of the first uh, several decades, we'll see that the Algonquins, as well as the French, are going to dominate not only the fur trade that we see within the American Northeast, but they're also going to win a series of wars that are known as collectively as the Beaver Wars before the middle of the 1600s. Now, the French, during these wars that we see uh, being conducted, they're going to do something very interesting that's going to eventually bite them in, a bu in the butt and lead to the rise of the Iroquois a little bit later on. We'll see that the French, since they were the only ones with the guns, they did not want their native allies to get a hold of these guns. The reason being is because they realized if they had a monopoly over the gun trade, the native populations would be increasingly reliant upon them for protection and so on and so forth. But by giving them guns, it could potentially make them enemies in the long run. And so for the first several decades that we see the French within Canada, they're going to refuse to give guns to their native allies or to any native population. Now, why does that matter? Well, it's because we're going to start to see that by the middle of the 1600s, other European nations were beginning to arrive on the North American continent a little bit further to the south. Most notably, we'll see that of the English in our next lecture, but most notably, we'll see the arrival of the Dutch. Now, the Dutch are major rivals to the French, and we'll see that they will not be as intent on creating a monopoly over guns as the French were. They will actively trade for furs within uh, the regions of um, of uh, what is now today modern New York, they would actively trade with the Iroquois-speaking Iroquois Indians guns for furs. And we'll see that the Iroquois tribes will get their hands on guns by roughly the middle of the 1600s. And this is going to change the power dynamic that we see within what is now uh, Canada as well as New York. Because the Iroquois tribes, the enemies to the French as well as their native allies have guns, whereas the native allies of the French do not. And over the course of the next 50 years, the Iroquois tribes are going to dominate that region and begin to push back the French, mainly back into where we see them in Quebec City. Now, during this process, the uh, French are eventually going to open up to trading guns with their native allies, and this will even the odds. And by 1701, we'll see that after the uh, French have re or opened up the gun trade to their native allies, they'll win a war against the Iroquois tribes, eventually um, uh, not destroying them, but dispersing them from much of southern Canada. But nonetheless, this will radically transform warfare for years to come because we'll see that the Native American tribes will begin to hone in their skills with these weapons, and especially with dwindling populations because of disease, they will begin to adopt hit-and-run tactics to where they will ambush uh, not only Europeans but also their enemies, so that way they can maximize casualties on their opponents while minimizing the amount of uh, sold or warriors they will lose killed in battle. And we'll see how that will come to fruition, especially during the French and Indian War a little bit later on. Now, Quebec itself, while it may have been established in 1609 or uh, 1608, and while we may see they have uh, some struggles, especially with the local tribes, it will kind of slowly begin to expand, especially by the time we get to the middle of the 1600s. Now, it is important for us to recognize that the French, while they're in New France, as well as we'll talk about uh, Louisiana here in a little bit, they're going to have a lot of issues with uh, 
a new group that was beginning to arrive, on, or I shouldn't say that, well, they'll have issues with a new group that was beginning to arrive, but they're also going to have a lot of issues in regards to trying to get their population to grow, especially in regards to Canada itself. When we think of Canada today, we don't think of it as this lush farmland that we see in the region. We don't think of it as this land filled with gold, but rather we often think of it as an icebox. It's extremely cold. And very similarly, the French will see this as the case back during the 1600s. And their population isn't going to rise very dramatically over the course of the next couple of centuries. And we'll see how that will be very much the opposite case for that of the English who we'll talk about here in a second. But nonetheless, by the middle of the 1600s, we start to see that Quebec City, as well as cities like Montreal and other outposts, will begin to grow in their population, especially as New France will be proclaimed a royal colony by King Louis XIV, and as we start to see the arrival of French women into this colony uh, by the middle to late 1600s. Uh, but anyways, by the late 1600s, as we start to see the population of uh, New um, France begin to expand, uh, and we'll see that the French are going to begin to settle the region of Louisiana, or the land of Louis. Now, the French will begin to explore Louisiana and the Mississippi River largely by 1671. That's really where they're going to begin to make a lot of maps in that area. And in 1682, we'll see that the French are going to look to make the Mississippi River, this great highway within the... Um, are on the western frontier as a part of their larger colony over in New France. And we'll see in 1682, one um, Robert, uh, I'm trying to remember his exact name, but anyways, uh, one uh, De La Salle is going to travel down the Mississippi River and he's going to proclaim the Mississippi Va River Valley, as well as the, all the outlying um, rivers that we see bleed out of the Mississippi River as the land of King Louis or Louisiana. Now after this, we'll see De La Salle will then come back to France and he will try to establish an expedition of colonists to come over to the Mississippi River to establish a colony at the mouth of that massive river to solidify French control as well as French authority within that region. Now, long story short, we'll see that he will get the funding and he will get roughly a couple hundred settlers to come over to the Mississippi River to settle this initial colony to solidify French authority, but that expedition is going to end in failure. Rather than landing on the Mississippi River, we'll actually see De La Salle would land in uh, Matagorda Bay, which is just west of us here in Texas. He will establish Fort St. Louis, and after ruining, ruining relationships both with the local native population as well as with his... Uh, uh, leaders of his uh, expedition will see that the colony would fail and De La Salle would be killed by members of his expedition in 1687. However, the French presence within Louisiana would not end there because we'll eventually see the establishment of New Orleans as a city by the beginning of the 1700s. Now, by the beginning of the 1700s, with Louisiana falling under French authority as well as with the um, establishment of Canada as a French colony, you will see that New France creates this great arc across the North American continent. However, despite the size of this uh, um, colony that the French established, once again, it has a very small population. And this population will be very fearful, especially of a potential conquest from their natural enemies that were lying off in the east, that were along the Atlantic seaboard and what we recognize today as the original 13 colonies, that of um, British North America. Now, around the same time that we see the um, around the same time that we see the arrival of the uh, French in America, we're also going to see the arrival of the British in America. Now, one thing to understand uh, as we start to see the uh, establishment of the British in North America, we'll see that these two natural enemies back over in the European co continent are going to bring their conflicts over to the American continent. Beginning at the uh, or beginning in the uh, 1600s and moving forward, we'll see that the colonies as well as these two nations over in Europe are going to engage in a series of wars. Early on, we'll actually see the English by 1629 are going to conquer Quebec City. However, Quebec would eventually be handed back over to the French a little bit later on. But nonetheless, we'll see over the course of the next several uh, or the next couple of centuries, the English as well as the French are going to constantly come into conflict with one another in a series of wars that we'll talk about here in the future. But anyway, as many of those policies that I talked about earlier about trying to increase their population, we will see they will be wary of the size of the English colonies because the, or the population within the English colonies will far outnumber that of the French. By the time we get to 1750, there will be almost a million people living in the English colonies 
compared to that of roughly about 70,000 people living in all of New France, Louisiana as well as Canada included. And we'll see how eventually those two colonies will be taken over by the American or by the English and later to the Americans a little bit later on. We'll talk about that with both the French and Indian War as well as future conflicts and future lectures. But anyways, that brings us to an end of our discussion of New France today. Make sure that you go online and you complete all the required readings as well as make sure that you stay up to date within the chapter, or I should say within the textbook with the uh, current chapter. But anyways, with that said, go ahead and end it on this note. Everybody take care, and I'll see everybody next time.